Size doesn't matter to us because sometimes you need big companies to make new big markets. And Amazon is in the logistics space uh, becoming quite transformational there. On season three of The Switch, we're really excited to co-host with Kathy Wood, founder, CEO, and chief investment officer of ARK Invest. We're going to dive into disruptive technologies from a few different perspectives. So continue the conversation now with how to assess the impact of disruptive technologies. Kathy, other firms break the world into capitalization bands and sectors. At ARK, you do it a little bit differently. Can you share your framework for looking at opportunities and in innovation? Sure. Well, uh, the five innovation platforms and, under, and 14 underlying technologies, that's the starting point. And just so uh, you understand how differently we're organized, our analysts' our responsibilities are not broken out by sector or industry or sub-industry. Their responsibilities are broken out by technology. So they are specialists when it comes to any one of these technologies and generalists uh, when they are uh, uh, trying to understand how these technologies will, um, will span sectors, different sectors. Uh, whereas the traditional world, of course, is very sector and industry focused. I think uh, that uh, traditional uh, asset management will have to reorganize uh, research departments in order to capitalize on uh, innovation trends. Now, so what with that specialization, what we're doing is taking a white sheet of paper with each one of these technologies and saying, okay, uh, an autonomous vehicle, what is that? We're not looking to any benchmark for guides because they're not in there, of course. Uh, we are, are taking that white sheet and saying, okay, what, what's going to go inside? What's going to make the mayor go, <laughs> right? And uh, we learned very early on, just to give you one example, that a company that we knew very well was going to be a mover and shaker in a way we never expected in the autonomous vehicle front because Tasha came in after doing this white paper search, what's going to go inside of this thing, came back in and said, GPUs are going to be the brains or the central nervous system of these autonomous vehicles. So once a stock comes to us like that, and in this case, NVIDIA was already in our portfolios, but for gaming, not for autonomous technology and robotics. Uh, so we took a look at the size of the market that uh, that would present NVIDIA with, and it was multiples, many multiples, of the market we thought it was going after, which was the PC gaming chip space. So once, so once we have the top down, how big is this autonomous mobility market going to be? And the, we now have seven years of modeling around this. We, as we bring a company into focus in this new world, we, we also do a, a bottom up analysis. Again, we had the PC gaming chip part of that in this case, uh, but now we had to bring not only autonomous vehicles, but all of artificial intelligence into it. Because NVIDIA or GPUs are responsible, we learned, for more than 80% of all AI training exercises. Imagine that. Uh, and then on top of the top-down and bottom-up modeling, we have a scoring system, a six metric scoring system, very important to innovation. The scores zero to 10, really any score dropping b below a six, the, com the, the stock is out of the portfolio. I'll use Tesla. It's one of our highest conviction names, as you know. Uh, so this six, uh, the first one is the company's management and culture. Critical, visionary leader, 
willing to stand up to short-term oriented shareholders and say, no, we have to invest now. So very important. Uh, the, the second is barriers to entry. Uh, what competitive advantages does a Tesla have? Um, I didn't have to explain the first one. We know Elon Musk is, is that man. <laughs> he might be very controversial, but he certainly is that visionary. The, the second barriers to entry, there are four, and we, or there have been four, now soon to be three. Um, the battery technology, three years ahead of everyone, and what we mean by that is costs. Uh, their artificial intelligence chip, nobody else has one. Uh, the incredible amount of real world driving data they have. And the fourth was over the air software updates to change performance metrics. Other car companies will have that soon, but they still don't. It's pretty interesting. Uh, the third is market, well, product uh, and market leadership. Uh, and this we can measure more quantitatively with uh, market share. Uh, in 2018, when Tesla was such a controversial stock, we had its market share dropping from, I believe it was 17% down to 11% in five years because there was a lot of competition and still it was a screaming buy to us. Instead, their share has gone up. It's at around 20%. Um, then we have execution. Execution to us is not, did they hit their operating margin to the decimal point? In fact, we almost hope they don't. We want them to be investing aggressively in R&D, uh, but also thoughtfully, not just throwing money at it. Uh, and, and Tesla has done that um, uh, in an incredible way. Uh, then we have valuation, which I know many people were, wonder about when it comes to our portfolios. And what we do is we've got these exponential growth curves that our uh, companies are going to be scaling. Uh, and we presume a certain amount of either market share gain or loss as this happens. And uh, we've sized the market. That's our first exercise. So market share. And then the gross margin structure, uh, what is it? Is it going up or down over time? And we come to an EBITDA number, an earnings number. And we will then put, uh, we, we've got all the metrics. In five years, we put a, I'm going to say a FANG-like multiple, so a fairly mature gross stock multiple on it for in five years. Well, um, we don't believe that most of our companies will be that mature in five years, so we feel we're being conservative. Now, a lot of people look at our multiples on this year or next year and think we're out of our minds. But if you give us that five-year time horizon, uh, we truly can tell you we're a value-oriented company. We think we used to be able to say we were deep value in when we started the company, but after last year, we can say we're now a value-oriented uh, manager. And then the last one is thesis risk. What, for example, what what has just happened with China? Uh, high thesis risk and rising there. In the case of Tesla. Uh, the thesis risk uh, actually has diminished as we've seen its competitive advantages uh, actually increase in the last few years, not decrease. Is, so that, that gives you a sense. Would you put regulatory risk in that category as well? Because you've been very, Absolutely. very bullish on blockchain technology. And obviously, there's a lot of unknowns in the regulatory environment that we just don't know what we don't know yet, right? Absolutely. Regulatory is a big one technology disruption. So disruptors coming to disrupt our disruptors, right? That's another uh, very big one. Geopolitical risk is another one. Well, uh, in the case of blockchain, let me uh, target that one directly. In our very early days of looking at uh, Bitcoin in particular, Bit Bitcoin's blockchain, um, I went to a, a, a conference. It was a small conference. No one was interested in blockchain technology at that time. Uh, but there were, there were lawyers, there were regulators, there was even an FBI agent there. And this was 2015. We took our first position in, uh, in September of 2015. And what I learned there is no regulator 
in the United States, whether federal or state, because state regulators were involved back then, uh, they don't want to be blamed from preventing the U.S. from uh, dominating the next big thing in innovation. And I saw that there. And then the FBI agent uh, put the cherry on the cupcake. He basically said, are you kidding? This is the best thing that ever happened to us. <laughs> what, who, what, what, uh, he said, the FBI is full of cryptographers. You're talking about cryptography. This is what we do. <laughs> and as we know, they have been able to crack some cases. So I think in, in the world of innovation, what is happening in terms of thesis risk um, on the, the regulatory side is actually diminishing because other countries want to dominate innovation, China being the most important one right now, but many others have become regulator friendly. Uh, when the FAA would not let Amazon fly its own drones on its own land, you had Australia, Hong Kong, Singapore, India, the UK, all volunteering and Amazon went. Well, that was a loud message. Kathy, these types of companies are everything from tiny private companies to big Fortune 500 companies, to projects within bigger companies. How do you decide uh, based on the size or whether that's worth investing in? Well, we're very focused on pure plays. I will say that it is very difficult. Uh, and the auto industry is a great example of this. It is very difficult for a company with old DNA to to transform into new DNA without a lot of angst. And you, you can see the multiples on the traditional auto companies. The market understands that moving from the internal combustion engine to electric and then from human driven cars to autonomous are two huge hurdles. And so Tesla gets one multiple and the auto uh, auto uh, companies get uh, a com or auto stocks get a completely different multiple. They they don't even resemble one another, and and that's right. And so that's why we like to stick more often than not with the pure plays. Size doesn't matter to us because sometimes you need big companies to make new big markets. And Amazon is in the logistics space. Uh, becoming quite transformational there. Uh, so, and I don't think a little company could could pull that off. Well, with something like Amazon though, presumably it could get to a point where it's just too big because none of the innovations underneath the hood are actually gonna move the needle. Isn't that a bit of a risk there that you end up with sort of the GE problem? Well, I think Amazon has been, has been very wise in how it has leveraged its own infrastructure for new businesses, AWS. I don't need all of this computing capacity except at Christmas. Uh, what should I do with it? AWS is a huge, it's the reason it has the valuation it has right now. Logistics, same thing. This is, this is they needed it. Uh, the infrastructure out there was not good enough for Amazon. And so they started doing it themselves and they are threatening FedEx and, uh, and UPS in many ways. So, um, but I would agree with you. I, I think something's coming around to perhaps haunt uh, Amazon. We might have seen a little bit of it in its recent earnings report. I think social commerce, Amazon is not a social platform. Instagram is, Pinterest is. Uh, this idea of social platforms where uh, young people especially go to buy things they see as they are being advertised on Instagram just because someone's wearing a particular dress or something they can buy it instantly you know Shopify is helping many of these social networks um, enter the retail space in a way that I don't think Amazon expected. I, I'm I'm guilty. Uh, Instagram t-shirt junkie. My <laughs> wife is very upset because these things keep showing up at the house. So, stop having a cocktail and getting on Instagram buying stupid t-shirts. <laughs> so, so, Caddy, there's so many ideas out there, so many innovative companies to take a look at. 
when do you know it's a bad idea or, or how do you avoid falling into value traps, for example? Well, we, we actually are, as we're looking at innovation, we're always asking the question, okay, what is this going to displace? Uh, and so we, you will not find us in any, uh, certainly value stock uh, that is in harm's way because we've done so much research on what is going to happen, how quickly it's going to happen, uh, that we steer clear. Um, we did a parody last year on bad ideas, and we think a lot of them are in traditional benchmarks right now. We think that uh, they're being populated increasingly by value traps, uh, and, and, and they're actually short innovation. Uh, so the way we've actually been able to penetrate uh, the retail space uh, is by saying to investors, look, um, we know you find our portfolios a little hard to digest given their uh, P.E. ratios on this year or next year's earnings. But and you probably wouldn't own any stock in our portfolio, therefore, but just know this you need a hedge against the, the disruption, the creative destruction that's going to occur in the traditional benchmark space. Uh, we can be that hedge for you. And, and, that, and that's how a lot of people have gotten to know us that way, they just, just as a hedge. And then they learn more about what we're doing and they say, wait a minute, this is the way the world's going to work, not the way it has worked. The value traps are in the way the world has worked. Great stuff, Kathy. Thank you. Looking forward to seeing you on the next episode of The Switch. <laughs>